Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. American Giant makes great clothing, sweatshirts, jeans, and more right here in the U.S. Visit American-Giant.com and get 20% off your first order with code STAPLE20. That's 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com, code STAPLE20. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell, one of our favorite, Gabriella Hoffman. We're going to consider the lobster. See what I did there? No butter involved, though, because this is TV and radio. How are you, my friend? Good to see you again. Good to see you, Andrew. I'm looking forward to seeing you in D.C. this week and formally connect and really happy to talk to you about this lobster situation because even if you don't live in Maine, this will affect you one way or another, whether you consume lobsters or you're sympathetic with the plight of these hardworking individuals. Yeah, I'm uh, going to be at the Young Voices thing where I'm going to lose to some very talented people for an oh. award I'm up for. Uh, th you hit it exactly right. I think fishing conservation is a success story when it's done right. This is a known formula. We can go back to the 90s when they started doing this. If you successfully conserve fisheries, the fishermen make more money. There's more product. The fishing grounds are healthier. The fish populations are healthier. The environment's taken care of because all of this gets regulated and oversaw by the government. So everybody's doing things the right way. This should be a success story. Why are we still banging our head about what is and isn't fishing conservation in the United States and America? I think it's attributed to the fact that we're still, in terms of environmental philosophy, there's still this inclination, especially among people on the center left, to promote preservation under the guise of conservation. And when you do this, you're pitting a different conservation stakeholders against one another. So you're essentially pitting, in this case, Maine lobstermen who are great stewards, generally speaking, of the lobster that they harvest and that they tend to. It's a 150-year industry, so they have to be, against the endangered North Atlantic right whale, which is in a very perilous situation. There's no bones about that, of course. There's only maybe under 350 individuals left. These whales are very protected. They have the strictest Endangered Species Act protection and Marine Mammal uh, Protection Act kind of barriers and, and labels on them. So they're very highly regulated. That's another conversation. I wish people would have a conversation about that. It doesn't mean you take the whales, but it we have to look into seeing what is actually failing the whale. Is it lobstermen or is it the government? What's really at the odds here? But they love to hinge it on the lobstermen. So I think over the course of the last several decades, there's been a battle of gear entanglements and whether main lobstermen should update their, let's say, equipment to cause fewer entanglements and fewer, uh, fewer rather, whale-human conflicts. So the main lobster industry, by all accounts, has made accommodations. They've improved their gear. They've tried to reduce their footprint, tried to reduce entanglements with whales, and their slight change of hand, or their rather changing of techniques, has led to fewer conflicts. And in the last 20 some odd years, they haven't been attributed to the demise of the whale. There's been no known recorded conflicts that can go back to Maine lobstermen because regulations would make it so. Uh, and under the Endangered Species Act, there's uh, the way that uh, Fisheries are regulated when you're involving, let's say, lobster, even though lobster is not endangered. But if it's relating to like the right whale, how do these uh, fisheries related industries kind of make sure that they're not encroaching on these endangered animals? So they have to go through various different hoops and barriers and follow regulations stemming from wildlife law to environmental law to be able to exist as an industry. And today, even with all the attacks, her uh, rather lobbied at these um, or volleyed at these industries, particularly, um, I think, what is it? The Biden administration is targeting 10 fisheries 
in particular, including the Maine lobster. And, and they're not the only one, but the Maine lobster gets the most scrutiny. And they say that they have to reduce their risk reduction by 98%. Um, the most recent rule change says by 90%, but a figure that a lot of the industry players have been using is 98%. But 90% is what one of the most recent rules about the Atlantic whale plan um, stipulated there. And so these lobstermen have made all accommodations. They've updated their gear. They've followed regulations, even at the expense of their livelihoods. They've seen years probably buoyed from very prosperous years to very not so prosperous years. And their livelihoods have hinged on how many regulations they are subjected to. And because they've made accommodations, they're willing to go along where it's reasonable, of course. But when these demands to reduce reduce risk by 98%. It's it's untenable, it's unrealistic for them to be able to achieve this. It's asking a lot of them. They've already gone through so much to reduce conflicts. There's no evidence of them contributing to the whale's demise. They're avoiding the whale and having conflicts with it. And if they, they understand, like any other conservationist, if they are imperiling this whale, which is in a very dire situation as a species, as a whole, everyone recognizes that. But if they were to make the whale's plight even worse, they wouldn't exist as an industry. Under the Endangered Species Act and other environmental laws, they would already have been regulated out of existence. So they know that they can coexist and they want to coexist with the whale. But they've also been pointing to different evidence, and we can go more into detail, that they're not directly entangling with the whale whatsoever. Migration-wise, the whales are not necessarily feeding in the Gulf of Maine much anymore. And so the, even when, let's say, um, so yes, there's Biden regulation, which we can go more into. There, there are several Commerce Department policies, this risk reduction, and then there's also a biological opinion, which also kind of enhances this risk reduction uh, demand or kind of regulation that they want to impose. And then you have, because of kind of nods from the federal government, different special interest groups or consumer interest groups, as they like to call themselves, but I think of them as special interests, um, different big box stores and I would say food delivery services like HelloFresh, um, Blue Apron and Whole Foods took a nod from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which has nothing to do with red lobster. They don't study red lobster. It's on a different coast, of course. And then they put out this red list on their seafood watch list that says you can't eat lobster, even though the fishery is okay. But this fishery in particular is known to interfere and, and be endangering this will. And again, no evidence of that. So that creates a lot of problems. It defames the industry. It defames the character of these hardworking men and women who go through grueling links to be able to harvest lobster. And they're responsible for 82% of the U.S. lobster catch, a very big portion. And people who love their lobster may bite the hand that feeds them if they go along with wanting to regulate them. And then in addition to this red listing of lobster, another thing came down from a U.K.-based nonprofit called the Marine Stewardship Council. They revoked the Gulf of Maine certificate saying that, again, the fishery is not sustainable. Lobstermen are endangering the whale. And then they concluded and, and conceded, rather, that there's actually no evidence of lobstermen hurting the whale. But they still went through with revoking their certificate. So, again, um, defaming the industry, misrepresenting their work, blaming them for the whale's plight. But there are other causes of this whale's demise and it's not from the lobstermen so it's it's a typical battle we're now seeing it play offshore we see these battles take place onshore with kind of predators like bears and wolves but it also similarly is found offshore in situations like commercial fishing whether it is harvesting blue tuna or main lobstermen in this main lobster in this instance so it's, it's not a new battle it's just one that's been brought to the forefront more and there's a lot to unpack from it because people just thought, OK, it was just these companies going woke. But they were getting nods from the federal government in a sense. And they've all kind of been these these special interest groups who triggered these lawsuits, then had federal lawmaking kind of reflect their lawsuits. And then it goes to these consumer groups who have big platforms and big microphones. And then they're misleading the public about whether or not lobster is safe to consume because of their alleged misgivings and alleged wrongdoing in this situation of the whale. But many scientists and experts have come out against attacking lobstermen and the lobstermen have been defending themselves. Those poor people, they've had to, they're, they're at risk of losing, you know, financial support to so the local banks and, and Mainers have been coming to the support of these individuals. Various different credit unions and banks have been giving them large denom denominations of money to fight these lawsuits to help support them because 
This employs 4,500 people indirectly, directly. It's a $1.4 billion industry that's at risk of going away. It's not so much the monetary contributions they make, but also just the history. In this country, when we lose industries like this that have been there for a long time, that have a culture and a kind of creative bent to it and, and has a purpose too. It's a, it's a purposeful industry. It's supplying catch to people. People love Maine lobster. Maine lobster is delicious. So to see something like that, a long-standing industry be under attack and potentially on the threat of going extinct, it should worry and, and cause pause for a lot of people, whether or not you live in Maine. So that's kind of the runaround of, of the situation, an, an old problem with a new fresh set kind of eyes and then ears. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. Did you know a 2018 study showed half of prenatal vitamins tested had unacceptable levels of heavy metals? I'm Kat, mother of three and founder of Ritual. When I was four months pregnant, I couldn't find a prenatal I could trust, so I created my own. Ours is made traceable, third-party tested for heavy metals, and recently earned the Purity Award from the Clean Label Project. But don't just take my word for it. Get 25% off at virtual.com slash podcast. A lot of these same players, Gabriella Hoffman joining us. We've seen them act differently, though. You talked about them bowing to special interests. Same groups, NOAA, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. Same area, New England, right? Back in the 90s, it was not lobsters. It was New England scallops. And they worked with the grocery. They had to shut the fisheries down for a little bit. That's in the 90s. By 2001, it was fully rebuilt within a, about a five-year period, a little less than. It's now one of the most profitable fisheries in the entire world, especially with scallops. Same area, same players, same everything. Look, we know this stuff works if you do it right. How do we get the special interests and the politics and what's good for the environment and the fisheries and good for the workers who depend on these industries? And you already just mentioned it. The, this is a core food group thing. I know people think lobsters, oh, well, that's a high-end food group. Yeah, but that goes through you know, distribution centers. Mm -hmm. That goes to restaurants. That goes to banqueting things. That goes to the White House for the state dinner with France for 200 main lobsters. You know that, And we're joking about it a little bit, but that's a supply chain. And we've already yes. been learning the hard way that supply chains are important. There's no excuse that what we have done before in the same areas with a similar situation, with a similar crustacean, works. Why? My same question again. Why are we banging our head on the table trying to figure out something so simple? And I know the answer is politics, environmentalism. Why can't we just understand that good conservation is always good environmentalism, but environmentalism isn't always good conservation for both businesses and for the environment at the same time? then these preservationists would not be raking in a lot of money <laughs> as they do creating an alarm over a perceived problem, but an easily debunkable perceived problem. It's it's their bottom line. You see these people sue and sue and sue and their, their evidence is being challenged now or their claims are rather being challenged by scientists, other reputable sources because people are coming out of the work and, and even NOAA fishery scientists. I had um, kind of done some more research and I lightly alluded to it in a recent town hall column expounding on this. But there are several NOAA fishery scientists who've said from recent years and more recently that you can't hinge the blame on Maine lobstermen because these whales are not migrating in the Gulf of Maine so much and they're not inhabiting it in periods of rest when they're not migrating. They're known to be going towards Canada, to other portions of the Atlantic Ocean, and that's where they're inhabiting. And there's very few instances, almost rare even, of any recorded conflict between the whales and the Maine lobstermen. And so even though that evidence is presented and it's there, these really powerful special interests continue to lie and defame this industry because they have the ability to. They know how to use the court system. I think a way to change this is reforming sue and settle laws, the Equal Access to Justice Act. There is an appetite to fix this law. It's kind of a um, obtuse law. It's from the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. 
And originally it was meant for protecting consumers. Um, let's say they were wrongfully done by something. So you could petition the government to get some sort of reward for whatever grievance you have. But it's been weaponized by people, especially lawyers, uh, who can charge a pretty penny for their services. And they exploit that law and they find ways to use it. They use advocacy groups. They find individuals who have been supposedly wronged. And then they they use that law, weaponize that law and sue and sue and sue. And some of the judges reject those court cases, but then they're not, they're relentless rather. Uh, they don't give up. If they lose in a lower court, they try to take it to the court of appeals and then ultimately to the Supreme Court. But they're able with the help of very powerful lawyers and a lot of millions of dollars from foundations, special interest groups, to be able to dominate news coverage and kind of define the narrative here because of how much money they have. However, when you unpack their work and you unpack their claims, None of it holds up in the court of public opinion. And the main lobstermen, unfortunately, are on the receiving end of these vicious attacks and this vicious slandering and libel that is coming from these individuals. They're not wealthy. A lot of these people, um, they, they may be servicing, let's say, a, a wealthy clientele because lobster is a lot more expensive than, let's say, other things we get in the chain or the supply chain. Um, it's it's a lot easier. I, I, maybe it's a lot easier to procure beef and chicken. Um, even with inflationary prices. But lobster is seen as kind of obviously a novelty item, um, but everyone can eat it in Maine. Regular working people eat lobster too, um, even though it is more expensive. And it's expensive because of the the process that goes into harvesting it. I've done crabbing and I understand why now crab cakes are really expensive in the grocery store because you have to harvest the crab. You have to lay down the pots. You have to pick them up. You have to then uh, deconstruct the crab. You have to uh, dress them, take out the meat, do this. There's a lot of things that go into it. Same with lobstering. And I'm hoping to see that in the region. I'm, I'm going to go talk to some mean lobstermen sometime in late spring, early summer next year, um, trying to finalize those details soon, but to really learn about the industry and see the safety measures and precautions they take. But it does come with reforming some laws. I would hope that um, people outside of the area, this is kind of my personal thinkings of this. And I think it even makes sense from a journalistic standpoint. I think people who are sympathetic with the plight of the main lobstermen, who understand that they're good stewards, that they're conservationists, one main lobsterman, I think it was on Jesse Waters' program on Fox News recently said, we were conservationists before it was cool. And that is very true. These people inherently want to make their resource a lot better. They don't want to impede on um, wild marine biology or marine wildlife. They want to coexist with them. And they love seeing wildlife. Anytime you go fishing offshore, commercially or recreationally, you love seeing birds flying. You love to see uh, swells with different fish. You like to see whales submerge and, and emerge from the surface of the ocean people like that and it's they're an important part of the ecological balance like the lo lobstermen know their place in the ecosystem and they can't exist without you know secondary tertiary animals and, and these critically endangered species too and so to me it just seems that the the preservationists have a lot of money they have a lot of legal power and they do have some supporters in very important roles they have allies in the federal government now who are attuning their rulemaking to these lawsuits and to the demands of special interests like the Center for Biological Diversity, National Natural Resources Defense Council, PETA, Sierra Club, all these types. These are very, very powerful special interests who largely give to the Democratic Party. And they're never challenged so much. I don't know if, if it's um, conservationists of all political stripes coming together to create outfits to combat them legally, politically. I know there are uh, different groups on the hunting and recreational fishing side that do, uh, but I think probably um, different conservation stakeholders will probably come together recognizing, you know, even if I'm not adjacent to Maine lobstering, th these special interest groups are going to attack my livelihood, my ability to do this, my ability to run a business or my ability to offer produce to people. So I think it comes down to, yes, fixing the laws and fighting them tooth and nail in the courts as well. And I think we could, and there are people who are doing that um, in other areas of wildlife conservation, but they are very, it, it, it's, it's out there. They are very powerful, but I don't think they can be untouchable. I think there is a way to kind of erode their successes in the courts and challenge them in the court of public opinion. It's, it's starting to happen. It's just gonna take a lot of effort.
Yeah, Gabrielle Hoffman joining us. I'm going to borrow something from our progressive friends a little bit here because I think it fits. But there's a disproportionality to these workers because you mentioned it in your piece. This is a $1.4 billion industry that's hinged on 4,500 people. That's an amazing ratio. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about an industry that's that lucrative, and yes, it's a luxury item now, but it wasn't always that. Lobster used to be the garbage food that the fishermen kept for themselves because nobody else wanted it if you go back 100 years, believe it or not. This is this is very much something that has emerged and built a market for itself, and it's hinging on only 4,500 people. This is one of those areas where the regulation should really, you mm -hmm. know, not to go all socialist on everybody for a second or up with people, but these workers really do need protection because the proportionality of such a small workforce for such a large sector of an economic thing, they really do seem to need some protections here, not regulations forcing them out of existence. It should be going the other way, shouldn't it? Shouldn't they be getting extra protections like, hey, this is a lot of money and a lot of people benefiting from a very small group of people. We should be looking at giving them a little bit of benefit, maybe not, you know, preferential treatment, but certainly they should get some considerations here, not the other way around. Is that a fair way to look at it? I think so. And it doesn't really have to go along the lines of collective bargaining or things like that. I think people just on the outset can recognize, and I don't really want the government to meddle with them even more, but I think what we're seeing on the ground now with uh, private interests coming to their aid financially and morally and legally uh, all these different stakeholders and, and people who are vouching for the main lobstermen, I think they could create an apparatus even outside of government to say, let's insulate our folks and let's help them and protect them and shield them from future attacks. I'm not sure if it comes in the form of uh, greater protections in the main legislature, maybe in Maine's, I have to look through this for a future reference, but I think maybe in um, maybe the main legislature already tries to protect them, but we don't see that obviously reflected in federal lawmaking because they don't view them as an essential industry. They probably view them this administration in particular probably views these individuals as contributing to a lot of problems, much like how they would perceive oil and gas developers. I feel like they put them all in the same camp. They're different industries, but they view them as extractive and negative, and they're not having a positive impact on the landscape, which is not how we should be viewing these individuals. And I think a lot of people don't understand in terms of where we fall on, on this chain and, and where these conservationists fall on this chain. You may complain about, you know, lobsters are contributing to the demise of one particular species and let's get rid of it. So what, what happens when you do that? You're going to create these secondary effects and it's ultimately going to hit the consumers. Whether or not you consume lobstermen, it's going to hit you somehow. It's going to, you won't see it. You won't see it in banquets. You won't see it at events. You won't see it at your lobster shack or your seafood shack. Much like with oil and gas, you call for the dissolution and development of it by an arbitrary deadline. It's going to have drought stream effects a little differently than lobster, removing lobster wood because you're seeing more so um, people's livelihoods hit rather than seeing a total collapse, I would say, in the economy. Um, but but they, they both have deleterious impacts if you were to eliminate them. Um, and they would have a lot of downstream effects for consumers, for those respective industries. It's not good to put these conservationists in a bind and make it difficult for them to operate because they're going out of their way, like I said, to make accommodations. They are willing partners. They want conversations at the table. From what I've read from different reports, and I've been getting emails from different kind of lobster interests, like lobster unions, and then like people in kind of like trade associations. So different people have been reaching out to me and saying, we really appreciate your work on this issue. So even people who may not necessarily um, agree all the time. I think the the lobstermen, the cause of the lobstermen has unified a lot of different factions in, in Maine and even outside of Maine. And so when they see people understand their industry, they'll come to you and say, hey, could we talk or we'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to share ideas, things of that sort. And so um, I think... I don't know what, what kind of protections I'm, I'm not so <laughs> coherent or well versed on, on what would need to be done because I don't want, um, let's say, the government to come in under good intentions and then, you know, create monopolies or things of that sort. I'm, I'm always worried about that. But I think they have to be recognized, at least as an essential business who's contributing to sustainable fisheries. In the past, we would never really see um, either one political party go after lobstermen but these like i said these radical preservationists have a very very iron very firm iron grip now because they see that they're losing power um when certain things are ceded to normalcy people like to see true conservation win and true conservation has worked in this country and we don't need to be pitting the interests of keeping a healthy economy 
with environmental stewardship. That's why I've done my podcast. That's why I go fishing and hunting myself. I believe that I live, eat and breathe it. I could, you know, benefit from doing these activities more according to my busy schedule. But at, at the surface, I believe this. There are many others out there, all of us, whether you're immediately involved or even removed from it. People do want these two kind of spheres to to meet and, and to work together. And it's very possible. We've done a great stewardship model. That's the envy of the world. Is it perfect? No, by no means. Nothing is perfect. But compared to other countries, having these different standards, allowing people to be productive and successful, all the while seeing species rebound, we won't see dolphins, whales, and others rebound if it wasn't for a fisherman, commercial or recreational. We wouldn't see iconic species like grizzly bears, gray wolves, American bald eagles rebound if it wasn't for hunters because of all the monies that go in to help endangered species get off the endangered species list and to make their full recovery. So people don't know what they're attacking. They don't understand kind of the the pipeline that exists. They don't understand who are the true conservation stakeholders and that these special interests, they come about this from the outside. They have no involvement. They just like to sue. And they say, we know what's better for everyone. They don't get to know these individuals. They don't know them as humans. They really don't care. They're kind of bulldozers and they want to bulldoze them out of their path for financial gain and with no gain to the environment. So it's it's a very dangerous course we'll be if this preservationist philosophy of environmentalism continues to prevail. But I think there's an appetite with the American people to return to or to rather adhere to true conservation, which allows for both the lobstermen and the right whales to coexist and exist. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church and Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcast at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Yeah, Gabriella Hoffman joining us. Let's wrap this up by going through that nomenclature, though. Preservation versus conservation versus environmentalism. I don't call myself an environmentalist because the word's kind of gotten toxic in a lot of okay. ways, but but I am a conservation. Look, I grew up in the woods. I grew up in West Virginia. I love the outdoors. Preservation is important. There's things that need to be preserved. Sure. Monument Valley needs to be preserved. There's mm -hmm. no commercial reason, natural resource that needs to be preserved. Anwar is the size of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. We can carve out a couple acres here and there mm -hmm. for some oil or whatever the case may be. Those are two different things, but both of those get labeled with preservation. Yes. But they're very different. Preserving, you know, a historic house in the city is one thing. Preserving something the size of a state, we need to have a conversation about some mm -hmm. free use. How do we have a better conversation about that? Not just policy wise or lawmaking wise, but also on our social media accounts and when we're just talking amongst ourselves. That terminology is really important. It's something we skim over, but we shouldn't because the language there really, really matters. I'll throw you another great word on there, old school world. My conservation comes from the way I grew up and was raised out in the country of stewardship, which is another good word, word that fits in here. How do we start talking about this in a better way? I think on an individual level, I'm starting to do this. I've been lecturing to different student groups across the country in the last year. 
I talk about this on my podcast in my writings. And if I have the fortune ever to write a book, I think my first book would be about how conservation is conservative and then explaining about it from a big picture kind of way, the differentiation, and then obviously hooking it in with how conservatives can do this. But it's a philosophy that's open to everyone, not just conservatives. But I really want to personally hone in on that more. And I think um, with my individual efforts, a lot of people have started to use that. They've started to use the moniker conservation is conservative. I don't have a trademark to it, but I, I've kind of made it popular in a sense in some circles. So people see me do it and they're like, okay, we'll do this too. And so maybe I've started a trend in that respect. So I think individually, um, that's what you have to do. You have to explain the difference. Like you said, there are certain places where preservation is paramount. I recently went to different sites in Arizona and Utah to, Utah to highlight areas where conservation are great versus where preservation works. I think in the national park system, the 63 national parks, and then they're adjacent kind of like public lands too with it. It's complicated kind of framework, but very easy to understand when you dig into it. So I think there's pretty wide consensus about keeping the national parks, which are off limits to any type of multiple use activities, except for let's say recreating, hiking, things of that sort, and occasionally fishing and very rarely sometimes hunting in the like maybe one or two national parks, but largely kept off limits to extraction of any type or recreational hunting or fishing in most cases, bar none for hunt, uh, hiking. Um, people agree with keeping that because there's something beautiful about these national treasures. You go to elsewhere across the world, there are their national parks are not really that impressive. We do a great job, even with some of the bureaucratic inefficiencies. They're not really good with upkeep of national parks. That's why the Great American Outdoors Act was passed to give permanent funding to certain funds within that law to ensure that the roads are built well, the structures are kept intact, we can accommodate more people, more visitors to the parks. That's great. And then when it comes to the to the more kind of complicated tiers of public lands like national monuments, national monuments can either be preserved or conserved. But I worry that the Biden administration is using national monuments as a way to designate land that should be open to multiple uses to make it secluded and eventually prepare them for a national park and not everything should be a national park. And I know it's counterintuitive for someone who likes going outdoors to say that, but not every area should be given that designation. It should be for an exceptional area. And then you can keep national monuments open to multiple uses um, and, and keep it that way because not everything should be a national park. Then it kind of dilutes what a national park is. Um, even though there are 400 some odd properties in the national park service, then you have Bureau of land management and, and for, uh, forest service lands, which should be open to multiple uses, whether you are cattle ranching, timber, harvesting, um, and many, many other types of things, hunting, fishing, running a guiding business, things of that sort. So we already have the infrastructure in place, very much so to do that. And um, and I think also visiting these areas personally, it's one to say, yes, you know, let's let's make everything into a national park or yes, you know, preservation everywhere. But when you go to meet local people in these areas, these are often rural communities. And I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of said individuals, county commissioners, activists. I've traveled to Idaho. I've traveled to Utah, to Arizona. And I'm going to be traveling to more places to talk to different people who are important members of their community um, opposing big government overreach or big scale questionable renewable projects. And it helps to visit these people, to hear their concerns, to learn about them, to learn about the areas they live. What is at stake if you were to build large scale projects, so-called renewable projects, where the energy that's going to be harnessed is going to go out of state in the case of Idaho? That's something I learned there. Um, so visiting these places is extremely pivotal. Not only are you going to have a great experience, if you get to interact with the locals, you're going to learn so much more about you and about the country than you ever would. And I think too many people, whether they live in the Acela Corridor or D uh, Metropolis, they're still very removed. And so when they come about saying, yeah, let's have preservation everywhere in every corner of the United States, you don't understand that not every place is the same. You can't have a big size fits all kind of attitude because every locality has different demands, has different interests, has different challenges with landscape and uh, financial needs, things of that sort. So what works in one place may not work in another place in a top, top down size, big size fits all kind of framework. And so that's what people don't understand. What New York City wants is not what, let's say, Twin Falls, Idaho wants. Everywhere is different. So going outdoors, enjoying national parks, seeing what's out there is extremely important. A lot of people have been recreating outdoors in response to the COVID pandemic, which is a silver lining, a positive development to come out of all this mess. Um, but it really takes going outside your echo chamber, going outside the Ivy Tower, 
meeting with people and having an open dialogue and a conversation, getting to know people and not imposing your views, which is what a lot of these preservationists do. So learning the nomenclature is important. Visiting these areas, talking to locals, having an understanding of why they may be opposed to top down government overreach, why they like to do things their way why they're not backwards and wanting to have that and why they support multiple uses when it comes to public land or um, having private property rights when they're managing property rights and whenever their land falls on public lands and those disputes in, ensue. And so it, it's not difficult. It shouldn't be difficult. And if I can help lead the way with the conversation, if people want a guide, I would like to be the Sherpa <laughs> with, with conservation, I guess. Um, in that because it's super easy to understand. I can't be the only person talking about this. And so I could give people a template to run with and, and to go. Um, th there's a lot of uh, things at play and, and we can help change the conversation and move away from environmentalism. Because like you said, it's a dirty word. I don't call myself environmentalist. I say conservationist. And you make the distinction of these two spheres of environmentalism. It makes it much more clear. We can resonate with people who are kind of in the middle if you're coming from a center right perspective, they love hearing that term better because environmentalism has become a very su sullied word um, and it, it needs a lot of rehabilitating. So I think conservation is the better word to use when you want to appeal to people for stewardship and, and all that. Yep. And I would encourage I'm going to be selfish. All you D.C. folks, if you'll just look out and turn left and go a couple hours over to West Virginia, you'll come to a lot and help my state out economically a little bit. I'd appreciate that. Great outdoor stuff there. You'll find it all over. Just a hop, skip and a jump from. I think the metro runs almost right into the panhandle now. So you can do it. Go out and get out. Touch grass. Touch some trees. Yes. Gabriella Hoffman, one of our favorites. You've heard it advertised right here on this program. She has a great podcast. Thank where you, she delves Andrew. into all this stuff. Districts of Conservation. Let folks know about that since they hear the commercial about it. Uh, let them know where they can find that. Let them know your very busy schedule, where you're writing, where you're tweeting, <laughs> your own little newsletter that kind of condenses all that. Let folks know how to keep up with you, my friend. Yes, very briefly. Thank you again also for pushing the podcast. It really means a lot to have supporters like you. So yes, on any podcast player, I prefer directing people to Apple. That's the best channel to listen. But we have a lot of actually interviews this month, even though it's we're going into the holiday season. Lots of great content. I've been interviewing some really cool up and comers and newsmakers that aren't really known kind of in the political space. So I hope people check out the podcast this week in particular. I spoke to some really great stakeholders all across the board. One individual, one gentleman who brought me down and a whole host of women to go deer hunting, um, some newbies. I'm kind of in the advanced beginner stage. And so I talked about his nonprofit and he's a serial entrepreneur, really fascinating guy. And he was just so generous in opening his family farm to us and, and to others. And so I really like his story and I want other listeners to, to learn about it. I spoke to a uh, expert on cataloging firearm statistics from Heritage Foundation. She's really great. Amy Swear. Um, probably one of the most interesting people cataloging uh, this. And then I spoke to the director of the Virginia Fly Fishing and Wine Festival in an episode coming out tomorrow to talk about riparian rights and access areas, his new book on veterans fishing, and then what to expect at the upcoming Fly Fishing and Wine Festival near Richmond, Virginia early next year. And so I like to interview people and, and bring regular folks to the forefront because everyone loves to talk to politicians. Politicians are great. They may get you some hits, but I think these storytellers are far more impactful in my mind because they can go a long way in shaping opinion, bringing people into the fold. I just don't want to bring people who are just going to yak. I, I like doers. So I like bringing on doers to the podcast. Um, yes, I have a Substack that comes out every Friday. I also have a MailChimp that comes out Monday. And the Substack kind of goes into detail more. It's called Outsider on the Inside. And once we get enough subscribers, I may start to create some kind of exclusive content. I won't take away from traditional access, but I may add some enhanced kind of exclusive features, maybe previewing interviews like a first listen for reasonable rates when I get about a thousand subscribers. So for now, <laughs> uh, subscribers can enjoy the content for free and then we will add supplemental content to not take away from what I'm already putting out there. But yeah, it's kind of a repository of news you may have missed in, in the conservation space and elsewhere. So yes, and social media, blue check marks everywhere, very easy to find me. Young Voices, I'm a regional leader. Um, that's how Andrew and I, of course, connected. It's a great program. We're looking forward to our upcoming uh, classes for 2023. We have some new contributors on the horizon from my understanding. So really looking forward to that. And yeah, I have other roles, too many roles to list, multi-hyphenate. Um, but yes, you can Google me and find me almost anywhere writing regularly for Town Hall. So thank you, Andrew, for having me. Always fun to talk to you.
She's so busy that she's actually at home today recording, and I didn't even recognize it because I'm so used to talking to her in a hotel room <laughs> somewhere because you're a busy bee. It's a great podcast. You do great work. You become a good friend. That's why we keep you as a regular here on Herd Tell. Thank you so much for the time, Gabriella Hoffman. You're great. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. Question. Have your thighs ever rubbed together, creating a rash because of friction? Chafe is no joke, but thanks to Mega Babe, it's also no problem. Thigh Rescue is the anti-chafe stick made for chafers by chafers. Get Mega Babe's Thigh Rescue and experience what 10,000 five-star reviewers rave about. Thigh Rescue stops chafe. With one sold every 30 seconds, you better run to megababebeauty.com.